Hello, I'm Bryony Cole from Future of Sex. You're listening to Transit Lounge Radio at Login 2018. It's wonderful to have you here in the Transit Lounge, Bryony. <laughs> Isn't it? I found this comfortable little spot here yeah. with a pretty plant and I some like daylight. It. I like it. Nice and lush. <laughs> That's what we're aiming for is some kind of lush conversational experience. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Exactly. I think what you're doing is really interesting. Would you... Tell our lovely listeners a little bit more about it. Sure. So my company, futureofsex.org, explores the intersection between sexuality and technology or sex tech. So we do a lot of research into all the new products and services coming out, whether that's robotics to VR sex education to health and education services on digital platforms. And we also run global hackathons where we encourage everyone to come along and to hack for a weekend and develop their own product or service or business around some sort of challenge in sex. It's open to everyone. It travels the world. So we do one every three months in a different city. Where's the next one? The next one is in New York in August and then we'll be in Europe uh, at the end of the year. Wow, that's really cool. So can you tell me on like a a couple of things that have come out of those hackathons? What sort of... So we've had specific challenges around providing people with disabilities some sort of sexual expression. Often these are populations that are perceived as invisible sexually and don't have access to resources. And it's incredible when you talk to people with disabilities just how much their sex education was way worse than even uh, mine was, you know. And so... Um, One of the teams in Singapore just last month developed a sex education program that's gamified, that's for for people who are either blind or deaf, and they're able to play this game and learn all about intimacy, whether through voice activation or be read through a game like that, or online on a screen. We also had a voice-activated vibrator developed in Sydney that's now going to the Sex Tech Lab in Paris in October, and that was specifically for people in wheelchairs. Wow, that sounds amazing. Like it's really opening up new possibilities for pleasure and expression for people who haven't had access to that before. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole point is like how can we um, provide this for everyone? So not just, you know, your general everyday person but ageing population, um, people with disabilities, all sorts of people in rural populations that don't usually have access to proper sex education and sexual health resources. And we're looking at how technology can change that. And then, of course, you've got all the fun stuff for for just, like, enhancing sex, whether that's sex toys or um, entertainment, adult (laughs) entertainment, um, and even robotics, which is what we're here at Login today discussing. And I think the question of robotics is really interesting. And so I was watching um, one of the BBC programs visiting the different um, Mm. people making the sex robots. One of the first questions I have is how do you know that the robot's consented? Like the robot is programmed to to consent to say yes. Is it enthusiastic, informed consent? Like it it brings into, I guess, you know, the whole issue of sentience in in terms of the robot you're having sex with. It totally does. And that's the thing that now we're we're crossing this grey area from it just being a technology like a sex toy toy or a sex doll to this technology that can talk to you, can recite you poetry, mm-hmm. remember your pizza order. And so it, it, there's, there's a very big question mark as to whether sex robots should have rights or they're just something like um, an Alexa or a virtual assistant that lives in your home that you bought and you have ownership over. And I don't think um, there's any clear right answer yet mm-hmm. simply because the technology isn't quite there yet for it to be. We all dream that it's going to be like Westworld or um, these sentient beings, but it's as as we'll see today, it's not quite there. It's still pretty clunky and it, it's still about rote learning and things that we we kind of use in other technologies at the moment too. So but the projection onto the future is huge. You'll see lots of media articles about, um, you know, sex workers' rights if sex robots are essentially considered sex workers um, what does that mean and the brothels that are opening up in Spain and across Europe how do you even negotiate consent with technology I don't have a specific answer for you as we're continuing to do the research absolutely and it sounds like I mean you've kind of you've carved yourself out a really fascinating niche in terms of the research (laughs) how did that come about (laughs) gosh I know I keep asking myself that Um, so I came through a back a background in technology. I'd worked on the future of work at Microsoft. I then moved to a role with Absolute Vodka working on the future of nightlife. Mm -hmm. And it was through there that I found this 
fantastic technology that I now know as sex tech when I was investigating how people are going to go out in the future. And a lot of it was revolving around dating and relationships and, let's be frank, sex. And so I was so fascinated by the ethical questions that it brought up. You know, if we were to put on a, a virtual reality headset and never leave our couch again and that was our new form of going out, what would that mean for family structures and falling in love? And so I started a podcast. <laughs> Brilliant. I mean, I think it would make a lot of introverts really happy to know, never I have know. to leave well, the couch. It doesn't I sound know. so bad to me. I, uh, weirdly, I'm also an introvert, <laughs> even though I, I do get out on stage. I'm definitely an introvert. So I love being by myself. And I think the potential for virtual worlds is incredible. If you've ever experienced high-end virtual reality, that is amazing to be able to dip in and dip out of social worlds like that and to have these connections. But there is something to be said for human-to-human -human connection that we haven't quite mastered through technology yet and I don't know if I don't know if technology can ever replace like the energy that you have talking to another person the feeling the touch of, of skin and the like the range of imagination and possibility yes. with a person so yes I agree that totally that imagination and creativity and let's say magic but a sense of intuition all these things that as humans we're so good at and it's predominantly on the right side of our brain but for technology, they all the things that technology is good at is all the things that we use on our left side of our brain, rational logic, data analysis, those sorts of things. So we're not quite there yet, but it's amazing how quickly technology is moving to that other side. But will it ever replace a sense of intuition? I don't think it can. Yeah, I, I don't think it can either. But I can understand also how addictive it can be, like how you can get so sort of swept up in that world. And also it can be easier to relate to technology than to humans who are unpredictable and messy and might say or do things that you don't want like if you've just got the you know if you've just got the technology catering to your every woman desire so I think that the, there's a, a shift maybe in how we also negotiate intimacy and relationships that this could kind of bring up interesting questions around that area. Yeah, and you see that already with the past 10 years, the proliferation of dating apps, right? From online dating where people filled out these profiles and they filled out 40 different questions and preferences to now the swipe culture and how quickly we can swipe away other humans. We can be sitting on the toilet taking a dump and swipe away 50 people and just the way that's changed our behavior and how we value connection and people and things has totally changed already so I think we underestimate how quickly our behaviors can change within a decade or a lifetime and that's the same to be said for these newer technologies where you can be connected remotely like teledildonics and these sorts of um, things that enable LDR, long distance relationships, to survive. And it isn't so far fetched to think that in the not too distant future, we will have entire relationships with people that are purely online and they could be intimate relationships. I know, I mean, the film Her, the Spike mm -hmm. Yons, where of course he falls in love with the, um, the voice, voice mm. is quite stunning for that. And it didn't seem very far from reality now. I mean, it, it almost already exists, you could say. There's um, applications in Japan, although I don't want to single out Japan because it definitely happens in the US and Europe as well. These technologies are being made. But Japan is the most advanced in terms of that AI being able to speak to you and treat you like... Um, a boyfriend or a girlfriend so there's a company called Gatebox and they have a glass cylinder with a cartoon girl inside that and she controls all the appliances in your home and the temperature in your home but she also sends you emotional messages text messages while you're at work and saying I miss you and come home now and I can't wait for you to come home and of course she turns the lights on when you come home but she also will will say all these sorts of things and ask you about your day and that technology is being marketed in Japan as a replacement girlfriend or wife and if you work for that company you get $45 a month as a stipend if you marry Gatebox and you also get her quotation marks for those listening birthday off wow. so yeah there's it, it kind of does exist already these ideas that we're falling in love with um, voices and and that concept like her it seems to mostly be, though, men falling in love with the woman robot or voice. Does it operate in the opposite direction? And, I mean, are you having conversations with the people who are programming this kind of material to also consider, like, gender equality and, you know, how it might work from the other, from the other direction? Yeah, and I think that's so important. That's one of the reasons when I 
you know, saw the potential in this industry, I went, oh my goodness, we have to involve more voices and more diversity in this industry. Otherwise, it's people that are creating in a vacuum, you know, virtual reality dates with supermodels and that's kind of it. And so it's a slow process. I'll say it's very dominated by white men at the moment, as most technology industries are. And you'll see, even if we look outside the sexuality aspect of tech, those virtual assistants, they all have female voices. Google, Alexa, Google Home, Amazon Alexa are all female voices. So there's definitely an issue there. And also, if you talk to the companies, there's not as much a demand um, from the female femme side for these sorts of technologies. We're actually quite happy with what we have. And the biggest sort of growth in what we call vaginonomics, which is vagina plus economics um, or femtech, is really around self-pleasure and understanding your body and Mm. your sexual health resources and new vibrators that don't look offensive that could sit on a coffee table or be in the museum bookshop as comfortably as they could be in your bed on your bedside table and really catering towards women Mm. and women's needs. Brilliant because I think it's also time that women were able to take space for their own pleasure and not just think that they had to please men or you know uh, also not just heterosexual relationships like you know some queer (laughs) um, but that was something that I was interested in um, asking you and that's (laughs) Uh, there's too many mind. things to talk about. When you you're really just like opened tech. Pandora's <laughs> box. The um the VR aspect, because I think you know there are concerns about VR, but you you were also talking about the way that VR can be used to to learn to be a better lover or to yeah. enhance you know your own understanding of sex or as as a tool for people who also don't necessarily have access to sex education. So do you want to talk me through that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I mean it's one of the areas I was most excited about when I stepped into sex tech. Is wow, we're using virtual reality in classroom scenarios for science classes and for history and the interactivity with those learning modules and the the engagement from young children is off the charts and it's a great tool for learning imagine if we transferred that to sex education where like by far and above like that is the most behind curriculum globally you can ask anyone anywhere I go in the world I'm sure it'll be the same in Lithuania they'll tell you sex education here is terrible you know we get an anatomy lesson we learn how to put a condom on a banana but we never learn the real stuff when we talk about sex we never learn about communication and empathy and intimacy and that's really the real stuff that makes the difference And so virtual reality is such a great tool for that because it can be private. You know, you can watch that in your privacy of your own home or wherever you are, but you're taken into a world that immediately um, is interactive, engaging, can be safe. And so the initial programs, there's some experiments in universities in the States. There's also Bedoink VR, which are a started as a porn company but has seen the responsibility in the porn industry to also educate their consumers because... Let's face it, porn has become default sex education for most of the world. This is like where most young people get their sex education from now, yeah? Yeah, and frightening. It's like the first uh, time that people see porn is as early as eight years old now. So how do we start to change um, what they're seeing and have some sort of interesting, engaging curriculum around sex and that's relevant to kids these days which is like sexting revenge porn cyber flashing all these things that they didn't exist when I grew up so how do we reinvent that and I think virtual reality is just an amazing medium for that and we're seeing initial um, applications as I said mostly through porn companies that have developed program called virtual sexology it's designed by a sex therapist it is um, hosted by a porn star but it will take young men through a or old men or whatever, um, (laughs) through a course dealing with premature ejaculation and for women, again, awareness about their bodies, how to get in touch with your body, how to feel more comfortable. So really cool applications in technology beyond just entertainment. And that sounds amazing. And I mean, I hope that there's then a way for people to apply that to to their lived experience because I think there's... Uh, it's still that that you know, still kind of 
crossing that boundary to intimacy is still something, it doesn't matter what technology you have, what app you're using, you still have to actually reveal yourself somehow. You still have to put yourself on the line to be intimate with another human being. And I think you can learn some, some things from technology, hopefully in a more positive way than negative, but at some point it still comes down to you taking that lead. Yeah, it does, it does. That's the intimacy. You can't, you can't manufacture intimacy. It's, it's not efficient like other technology is, and I think that's where we need to understand that's what humans bring to the sex equation is intimacy that's cultivated through shared experiences that takes time that builds up that has depth and that's our special source (laughs) indeed and so sadly we're almost out of time I could talk to you for hours more (laughs) but one last question is what is your vision for the future and how do we get there thank you so my vision for the future is all about um, having a more open less judgmental less shameful culture around sex just normalizing that conversation is a great first step but I think when we think about the world and how much we carry sex in the shadows and the creepy dark stuff that evolves because of that the more we start to talk about sex normally the more we start to Um, be open about uh, preferences, I think we'll see a better, happier society. Wonderful. And clearly you're already taking steps along that path. I have to catch up with many, many episodes on your podcast. (laughs) I can't wait. Yeah, you've got to let me know how how it is. Future of Sex uh, on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, wherever you're going to listen to a podcast. Awesome. And I'm sure everyone will be listening. Thank you so much for talking to me. It was really a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. (laughs)